Alan Shore of the UCLA School of Medicine has stated that we are all hardwired for relationship. Dr. Shore's statement reflects a growing belief in the field of cognitive psychology based on a growing body of scientific research, a belief that explains this feeling of complete understanding and the level of connection, attachment, and relationship that we all seek. Most of the studies that have come out of animals have focused on anxiety as being the key affect. The problem is that with human beings in the first year of life, joy is much more the key to the attachment. By um, joining with the child in making this dyadic system, what they are doing is they are interactively co-regulating very high levels of positive emotion. One of the great fallacies uh, that many scientists have is that everything that is before birth is genetic and that everything that is after birth is learned. This is not the case. There is more genetic material in the cerebral cortex at 10 months, much, much more than there is at birth. What this means is that the genes are spinning out, are programming well into the first year. They don't stop at birth. And the genes that are encoding the connections between those parts of the brain that are coming on later, therefore, are in a very active state well into the first year. Dr. Shore may have been speaking about mirror neurons, recently discovered and thought to make up a system that allows for empathy between people. The human brain is composed of neurons and their supporting structures, single cells that connect at over 100 billion sites. Much like a computer's circuits, which are turned either on or off to form complex electrical loops and thereby process information, Neuronal loops are thought now to form the physical basis of human consciousness and personality. The growth spurt of the brain is occurring from the last trimester of infancy through the second year. And at that time, the, the brain is more than doubling in size. It's connecting up. But its maturation is experience dependent. It's not as if the genes are encoding how everything is going to fall together. It needs certain types of experiences for the brain to grow. Certainly, neurons respond to sensory stimuli. Mere neurons, a subset of the full mass of the brain, respond to a specific subset of stimuli, both from the senses and from thoughts in the mind. Early in the 1990s, it was discovered that these same neurons fire when we perform an action, imagine ourselves performing the same action, and even see others performing the action. These subsets of our brains allow for us to mirror others, in the words of Dr. Daniel Siegel, empathetically being in another's emotional shoes. These parts of our minds are continuously processing information we often do not even realize is being presented to us. Subtle smiles, vocal inflections, eye movements. Interestingly, these signals, which are constantly being presented to each of us, by others looking to connect on multiple levels of communication can be consciously seen and appreciated if we look in the right way and in the right frame of mind, one of openness and true caring. The right hemisphere ultimately comes, becomes dominant in the humans for social functions, for emotional functions, for the processing of social emotional information, it also becomes dominant for empathy, for the ability to empathically understand the states of other human beings, to be able to read their intentions. This is done at levels, at unconscious levels. This is done at intuitive levels. Imagine, if you will, a moment in your life in which you felt completely understood. Make it a moment in which your feelings were completely shared by another person who seem to click on every level of communication with you. And the most important parts of the brain that we're looking at in the first year to grow by my own thoughts are those parts of the brain that are involved with the emotional and the social functioning of the child. Those are the ones which are embedded in the attachment relationship. In order for those parts of the brain to grow, which is part of the limbic system involved with emotion, 
Certain experiences are needed. Those experiences are embedded in the relationship between the caregiver and, and the infant. If they're positive, if they're regulated, then we'll have an optimal situation and literally the potentiality of the genes will be carried forth to the fullest, so to speak. And so now one of the most important recent discoveries in the last 10 years in biology has been this idea about developmental cell death. The brain does not continue to grow and grow and grow. It organizes, then it disorganizes, then it reorganizes. And the disorganization of the brain, which is the mass of death of billions of neurons and the disconnections of synapses, is part of how the brain is growing as it's reorganizing. Those uh, connections that are not used die off, which is why early enriched environments, which means emotionally in early enriched environments, more so than wonderful little uh, dangling colors and shapes, uh, are key here. As if to say there is something in, there's something necessary that the human need, that the human brain needs in terms of other human contact for it to grow. It's a use it or lose it situation. Cells that fire together, wire together. Cells that do not die together. In fact, it has been said by Marinus van Eisendorm of Leiden University that between infants and their caregivers, the strongest predictor of secure or insecure infant attachment to the infant's caregiver has been and is the caregiver's state of mind. The genetic systems that are encoding the connections of the highest parts of the brain that are involved in social and emotional functions, which are literally the hierarchical apex of the limbic system, are spinning out at 10, 12 months. Those, gen those genes are being affected by the hormones that are being stimulated in the relationship between the mother and the infant. Because when the mother and the infant are in a dyadic dance, when they're attuned to each other, the work of Hofer is now showing that literally their psychobiological systems are co-regulating each other. And that, for example, their, their opiate systems, their endorphin systems are now mutually regulating each other. But we know for a fact that the endorphin systems regulate genes positively. We also know that cortisol, which is the stress hormone, also directly regulates genes. What I'm saying by, by this is that the, the attachment relationship is directly regulating the genome. It's directly regulating the way that the genes are going to encode the proteins, etc. This goes far from the idea about what is nature and what is nurture. They're coming together. And it's been said that literally the first gene-environment interactions are found in the psychobiological interaction between the mother and the infant. Making communication on a level we don't often realize is present, let alone essential for infants and caregivers both, more appreciable and useful in forming secure attachments. The circle of security, from safe haven to secure base, is changing the lives of infants and caregivers with each turn of the circle. What the attachment relationship is, is a combination of the psychobiological predisposition of a particular infant, which is genetically encoded, and the interactive experiences that the child has with the caregiver. Most of the studies that have come out of animals have focused on anxiety as being the key affect. The problem is that with human beings in the first year of life, joy is much more the key to the attachment by um, joining with the child in making this dyadic system, what they are doing is they are interactively co-regulating very high levels of positive emotion. So essentially what the attachment relationship is, an interactive mechanism for generating very high levels of positive affect. And the positive affect, this goes to the work of Tompkins, etc., is enjoyment, joy, and interest excitement. Take your toy back to the carpet. They get toy back to the carpet. Oh, no, please, no, please. They get back! <laughs>